Hi everyone, uh, and welcome for the fourth and final session of our workshop. Um, it's my pleasure to chair this final session with uh, Dr. Estelle Seitz, uh, who is from the uh, African Population and Health Research uh, Center, HPHR APHRC. Um, Estelle is a specialist in maternal and child health, and she has worked on Sub-Saharan Africa for over a decade now. Well, we, we met a couple of years ago when we both uh, were involved with the UNFPA project uh, on tracking financial expenditures for family planning. And this is how I thought um, this expertise, her expertise would be very, very valued for um, the purposes of this workshop. So today, Asal will tell us um, the work she has been doing for um, mater maternal and child health. Uh, and specifically her work for the um, Countdown to 2030 project, which as some of you may know is part of the um, Tracking Sustainable Development Goals Progress. And it was previously, or, or it kind of emerged uh, after Countdown uh, to 2015, which was aimed to track Millennium Goals um, progress. So in that respect, she will tell us how in policy level um, maternal mortality is being addressed and also what is done on some regional level specifically. Um, so we are very much looking forward um, to your questions and first Estelle will tell us um, about her work. Good afternoon all. Um, I'm Estelle Monique Sidze. I'm a researcher at um, the African Population and Health Research Centre in short APHRC in, in, in Nairobi. Uh, where I do some work on, um, on maternal and child uh, health in the Sub-Saharan African region. Uh, today, um, I'll prepare a presentation uh, within uh, this workshop around regional progress and, and policy response to reduce maternal mortality in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I know from the program that you already had um, a 300 presentation that gave you uh, also substantial background around the issue and I hope this presentation can fit perfectly uh, within that um, to at least give you a bit more detail around the statistic in terms of progress that countries have made in the region but also looking at um, uh, a policy assessment of what uh, my um, uh, be useful uh, policy-wise uh, to be able to achieve um, uh, this progress. But uh, briefly before I go um, within my presentation uh, for today, um, uh, I will say also I was really uh, uh, looking forward to do the presentation in person and of course visit your, your beautiful campus and uh, to be able to interact directly with you. But this fortunately was not possible due to COVID-19. Um, hopefully I have another opportunity to visit your campus. Uh, let me, as you can see now on my slide, just briefly, um, uh, um, having um, just in two words tell you uh, what my organization do just for you to also have a bit of background of what I do and why or where I'm located in this world so as I said uh, I work for research organizations um, are based uh, in, in Africa so we are international NGOs registered in the US but uh, uh, headquartered in Nairobi, and we also have an office in West Africa, so in Dakar, Senegal. So we do mostly research, and research not just around maternal and child uh, well-being, but we do research across six uh, 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 wide thematic that you can see on the screen. And we also do a lot of policy engagement, uh, just because we believe um, uh, we cannot kind of have evidence generations without making sure that that evidence is used for policy making uh, because policy making is actually the key in terms of, uh, of achieving the health outcome that you're looking for in the region. So we also do a lot of research capacity strengthening um, within the continent. So with, um, with uh, university staff and also students, master and PhD students, but also out of the continent. So we have a lot of internships uh, that we offer also for students uh, in the American and um, European institutions. And um, uh, if you're interested, you can go uh, on the website, 
www.edhc.org and we'd be more than uh, happy to to welcome you and to have you use our data or to take you through the policy engagement, at least take you to the field to have um, a first uh, uh, a look on uh, what is really happening on the ground in, in terms of health issue that uh, you're working on. So, yeah. So for these, uh, uh, for today's presentations, uh, we'll uh, take you quickly, uh, about uh, 20, 30 minutes around um, uh, uh, maternal mortality uh, declines in the continent uh, using this uh, outline. So the first uh, point, a quick background. And the second point, the declines that we have observed in MMR, so maternal mortality ratio, I will be seeing MMR uh, across in Southern Africa. And then uh, the third point, policy factors that explain some of those declines. And a, a, a few minutes spent on country cases, which is really important. And the fifth point, the last point, is really uh, what we should keep in mind. So if there's one thing that you wanted to remember from this presentation, is really uh, that last point. So quickly in terms of background, I'm sure you have a lot of background around maternal uh, mortality issues, uh, but just quickly put uh, uh, again into the minds what uh, we are looking for in terms of when we're talking about decline, what are we talking about? So looking at the targets. So you are aware of the SDGs and SDG 3.1, especially that is around good health and well-being. Uh, with targets for global maternal mortality rate and also, also infant, infant, infant mortality rate. So in terms of maternal mortality rate, um, you know the target at global level is really to reduce that ratio to 70 per 100,000 uh, live births. And um, uh, what also we know from the SDG target is that the global country targets are different and it's very important, especially at country level, to understand and analyze what they need to achieve at the country level. So the global target is 70, but uh, it's achieved only when each country uh, will achieve a two-third decline between 2015 and 23rd and 30. And um, um, what we uh, know also is that if you look at the targets, we said by two-thirds, but it really depends where the country were at baseline. So uh, what the targets say for countries that um, uh, had, had a, a motor, maternal mortality uh, ratio less than 420 at baseline, they have to reduce it by at least two thirds. And actually, this is concerned a lot of countries in Sub Saharan Africa. Uh, for countries that have an MMR greater than 420 at baseline, so a lot of countries also in Sub Saharan Africa, and this, in this uh, scenario, the rate needs to be actually steeper. Uh, so faster than the other countries, so that in 2030, uh, no country has at least uh, MMR greater than 140. So um, this is in condition of the fact that maybe some of those countries, uh, looking at the 2030, that's about 10 years now, will not be able to have uh, a rate that is 70, but at least uh, for those countries, uh, we assume that if they kind of push through and, and put the right policies in place, uh, be able to um, at least be at 140 and, and, and below. And uh, for countries, of course, countries like European, uh, Central and Eastern of, uh, European countries are other countries in the developed world that have a very low maternal mortality ratio is really uh, now in terms of achieving equity for vulnerable population at subnational level. So uh, uh, in the US, for example, you take an example, having equal uh, or at least having equitable uh, maternal health outcomes and, and mortality declines within, for example, the black and white populations and all that, so that we achieve a kind of equity, which sometimes is not there. So in terms of um, uh, the crude statistics, um, I've, I've picked uh, mostly the general ones for you to have a sense. Uh, we currently have at the center a lot of details, especially within our work uh, with the Countdown to 2030 initiative. Uh, we've worked in the past two years uh, leading a regional initiative to help countries in the sub-regions to track the progress of maternal mortality and other uh, reproductive uh, health outcomes. So we have a, a lot of uh, statistics right now uh, provided by WHO, UNICEF, World Bank and UNDP. Uh, and if you're interested, I can still uh, share those with you if you want in-depth analysis. But this one is that I'm showing right now, the slide is really uh, general statistics so for you to have a sense of how uh, much decline we have, we have observed in the 
in, in, in the African region and of course compared to the rest of the world. So this statistic, as you can see, the title is November 2015. It's not easy to have updated maternal mortality uh, uh, rates statis uh, statistics um, uh, as quick as possible. So we kind of sometimes like have a two, two years lag in between when we get the, 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 the annual report from the WHO, uh, just because I'm, I'm sure you already know the challenges, especially in the sub-Saharan African uh, countries to really collect that information and, and really provide those estimates. But uh, if you look at the latest estimates so, uh, from uh, November 2015, you will see on the uh, extreme left, so you see the sub-Saharan African region. So you see good declines that were observed between the rate in 1990. So these are between 1990s and 2015. So the blue one is 1990s and green uh, 2015. So you can see a steep decline from 987, 500,000 uh, birth to 546, which is a good decline. Um, you can see, of, of, of course, also that there's kind of um, uh, really uh, differences within the region. So you see Eastern African, uh, Southern African uh, uh, region, you can see that they have the, the, high, the highest rates of changes if you compare to West and Central Africa. And uh, also if you can see them already coming at a lower rate compared to the, the Western and Central Africa uh, region. So now uh, what you can just, maybe one thing that you can remember from this graph is that um, the declines are there, they're observed. But if you look at some of the region, especially the Western and Central African region, the decline is not as steep as uh, is required to be able to achieve the targets that I mentioned before by 2030. So they need somehow to be accelerated for each of those countries uh, to have at least uh, 140 and below 140. And the policy, of course, is very important for, for this change to be uh, accelerated. So uh, the second thing I think is very important to also re uh, remember when we talk about declines, like we, we can celebrate the decline and say, hey, yes, we have, we, have, we have put a lot of work and we can see that there are less uh, mothers uh, die because of childbirth across the region. But what we're observing also by working with countries, especially within the countdown to 2030 initiative is that there is a large and persistent inequality regarding those changes and those improvements at some national level. And uh, uh, what you can see um, and, uh, uh, beyond the fact that you see some countries like Rwanda, for example, have achieved tremendous great gain and uh, uh, you know, outliers like Cameroon uh, that have achieved uh, very few gains. You can also see if you look within Rwanda, within Cameroon, you can see, for example, that there's huge inequality related to wealth still, despite some policies by those countries. And those inequality actually what now we need to uh, really tackle within the regions and at least for countries to be aware that um, this inequality needs to be bridged. And um, why bridging those inequality uh, in terms of reproductive and uh, maternal and child uh, uh, health intervention coverage? Uh, because I'm, I'm sure you, um, you are aware of the main causes of mortality uh, in, in African countries. So uh, hemorrhage, most of uh, women die because of, uh, of bleeding after birth and there is no available uh, a blood or a blood products for the women, but also for reasons related to hypertension and and uh, and uh, also uh, related to obstructed labor. And we know that most of those, at least those three primary causes of death, can be um, tackled if there is appropriate interventions. And those appropriate intervention, um, what science tells us is that women have antenatal care, at least four plus visit. WHO have revised this to eight plus visit. Uh, skilled birth attendants, so they don't deliver at home. And of course, postnatal care, so um, uh, to ensure that they're, they're doing well 48 hours after birth themselves and their children. And um, uh, science also tells us if women have access to these critical interventions within the continuum of care, we reduced significantly the, the, the risk for a woman to die within childbirth or the days uh, following childbirth. So um, what explains then the differences that you see in maternal mortality within countries and also across countries in the region is really the coverage in those interventions. So here you see, for example, my slides, the differences in, in, in interventions coverage uh, by wealth 
index. So to really show you the inequality that we still have within uh, countries regarding uh, access to critical services. So if you see uh, countries, for example, at the bottom, countries like Cameroon, so you have a comparison between 20 for 2004 and 2011 uh, across these different interventions. You see, uh, for example, that in Cameroon, if you look at uh, being an antenatal care or skilled birth delivery, you'll see that there's huge gap, sometimes 20, 40% differences between the richest populations and the poorest population within the countries. And you can see that those gaps have not really, really closed over the years, so between 24 and 2011. So that explains why uh, being a national level or within country, for example, in Cameroon, you don't see the um, expected declines in maternal mortality. So, uh, so just keep in mind, so when we talk about maternal mortality rate, is really in terms of uh, uh, poor access to those interventions for women. So if you want to change and accelerate the decline, of course, you have to increase uh, the coverage of this intervention and make them equitable across uh, different segments of the population. So now if it comes to assessing the policy uh, response that countries have in the region in terms of um, um, accelerating the rate of decline in maternal mortality rates or at least to improve the maternal health uh, outcomes, of course we have to go back to the, the famous WHO health system based in blogs and I'm sure you've come across or have used or is, are using uh, these. Uh, and this is really a logical framework that really helps us to understand input and, and output and um, the outcome. So if you want to, to understand the um, if you want to, to understand the impact, so the maternal mortality ratio in, in our case, and of course the outcomes, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, coverage along the continuum of care and equity, uh, you have to uh, relate this or translate this to what countries put that inputs and the inputs, uh, the building blocks you have, the governance and leadership, you have the health workforce, adequate health workforce uh, within the countries, you have different commodities, health information system, the legislative framework and health system financing. So. Um, uh, for most of the countries, uh, the legislative framework and the health system financing are very critical to be able to achieve the outputs and the outcomes from, of course, the impact that um, that countries are looking for. And it's much so even in the, in, in Sub-Saharan African region where uh, sometimes uh, um, countries have not really uh, well adequate or very strong policies and sometimes they're kind of struggling to implement them because of not having the, the resources or the, the technical assistant needed to be able to do so. So um, as I mentioned, the uh, work that we do within the countdown to 2030 is really to assess this policy, but really assess uh, the gaps that uh, uh, exist there within countries and really see where we can provide assistance or uh, where uh, we should do more or at least nudge countries to do more in terms of um, ensuring that by 2030 uh, all the countries have achieved the targets that, that they've set at national and of course of national level. Okay, so some of the tools that um, uh, we've been using within our work to really assess um, uh, the progress that countries have been making regarding the maternal mortality rate and of course, of course also improving uh, maternal health outcomes and, um, and seeing how they're doing policy-wise uh, um, uh, shown here. So you have the policy and program timeline tool, uh, the health policy tracer indicators dashboard, the health system tracer indicators dashboard, and of course the program implementation assessment. So these are some of the tools that we're using to really interrogate the progress that country have made. and. Um, uh, we really ha use an interactive um, mode with countries to really uh, look in through um, these different uh, uh, um, uh, points that you can see in the loop there. So really agenda setting, the first one. So agenda setting, uh, really looking at uh, if the countries have generated or have available the, the epidemiological evidence that they need to be able to, to set their own agenda. As I said at the beginning, there is a global target, but there's also country target, and of course, country targets at national and subnational level, and it's really to country to own that agenda setting, and to be able to know, being within a quarter, within two years or five years, what they want to achieve. So be able to put in place 
uh, two or five years or 10 years strategic plan, for example, for the country. And uh, you can see the countries that made the biggest progress or declines is really the countries that have that agenda setting um, um, uh, process uh, right. So the second point is the policy formulation. So really when you have the agenda is really to look at the policies and guidelines that can, can help with them for implement or to, 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 to achieve um, the targets that are made. And the policy formulations um, um, is something that has been also slightly improved in most of the countries. Uh, that, that I, I, maybe I think maybe from my work and from the countdown work that we're doing, what to see um, where the issue still is maybe is a third point in terms of implementation. So there's a lot of countries that have a lot of policies and beautiful policies and guidelines being put in place, but uh, because sometimes there's no country commitment or or to achieve uh, uh, to implement those policies or at least um, not financing uh, available, especially at domestic level you kind of have poor implementations of those policies, so you end up not having, of course, the, the right result or outcome that you're looking for. So uh, one thing, critical thing that we're looking at is really how the countries have implemented those, what are the stages of implementation that they have. And of course, the next, next step is really to understand how countries are able themselves to assess the changes in interventions and coverage and assess, evaluate themselves. Uh, within the country at national and, and again a sub-national level. So really having proper monitoring and, and evaluation framework and um, what we've seen also uh, critical that some countries uh, sometimes don't really pay attention to is really having those monitoring and, and, and evaluation framework where they can actually sit within a ministry or within a department of the ministry, so the reproductive health and maternal and child health department, and really say this is the progress that we set ourselves to achieve within this year. And if you look at the mid-year review, for example, this is where we are, this is where we think the gaps are, this is what we need to change, for example, uh, for the next uh, quarter or the next six months to be able to see the progress that we intend to see within the year. And there are very, very few countries that have that. And if you, you remember again the first slide that I put in terms of declines, original level, if, um, if I see the work that we're doing comparing West African and Central African countries and Eastern and Southern African countries, you see a difference between the two regions because uh, Eastern and Southern African region have, I would say, a lot of support being a national uh, uh, with um, international partner to really uh, have those uh, opportunities and, and financing to be able to make those kind of, of, of uh, reviews at national level and, and, and the subnational level possible, which sometimes you don't see in Western and Central Africa. And these are some of the gaps uh, that uh, we, we think are we highlighting and, 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 and hoping they will change over time. And of course, at the center of, of the, the, the graph, you have decision making. So decision making is very critical. Uh, um, to be able to achieve the outcomes that uh, that each of the country uh, set. So yeah, so of course you have a lot of time um, to ask uh, questions and, and have comments around this, and we can discuss further. So if I go to the next slide, uh, uh, looking uh, specifically on the health policy tracer indicators uh, dashboard. Um, these are some of the policies also that um, uh, that were identified within the expert regional convening uh, by the UN and their agencies um, that uh, um, are viewed as being very critical to um, to be in place to 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 help in, in seeing some progress in maternal mortality rate or child health uh, or maternal health in general. So the 11 policies um, I've highlighted um, from the number three to number eight, that is really critical, those ones that are really critical for maternal and child health, uh, especially as far as maternal mortality uh, uh, is, is, con is uh, considered. So you have the midwife authorized for specific tasks. Uh, the fourth one, maternity protections, as per the Convention 183, the maternal death notification, uh, the postnatal home visit in the first week after birth, the kangaroo mother care for low birth weight newborns, and of course the antenatal uh, corticosteroid for management of preterm uh, labor. And if you remember earlier in my presentation, uh, uh, when I was mentioning that uh, the causes of death um, uh, in, in the region, and of course in most of the developing region, are really uh, uh, around hypertension, around uh, hemorrhage, 
uh, and obstructed labor, and uh, some of those policies are really critical to to avert a number of deaths by reducing those uh, those complications. So, um, what I've seen in the region in terms uh, of of these policies is uh, most countries have been trying to put that in place, and that's why you, you obs uh, we observe such decline, uh, especially in Eastern Africa and 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 um, Southern Africa uh, over the years. Uh, is uh, what I, I will say is still maybe not put in place that might be useful for accelerating the progress is really this uh, the kangaroo mother care, uh, which is not sometimes not um, um, it's very difficult to implement, especially in facilities that are not the central one in the main main cities of the countries. And of course, a critical point that you might be aware or know uh, that most countries are, are struggling with in the region is really the death notification. Uh, and, and maybe that's why I mentioned earlier that it's sometimes very difficult to get timely uh, statistics or material that because of a delay in notification from you know, from a rural place to the uh, common uh, central point at um, at um, at um, uh, subnational, of course, uh, triggering down with the health system at uh, at a national point. Um, the registration system, um, it, it's sometimes unfortunate to, to see, uh, still see that in some of the rural areas um, in the region, you still have uh, children uh, who are born and die within a uh, number of days without even having a trace of them existing in the system. Uh, it's something that has been um, um, improved over the years, but uh, we still see a lot of instances, especially even in Kenya, where um, I was uh, carrying on a, a project recently where you have almost 50% of, of children in certain um, areas, especially in rural area, not having a birth certificate, for example. So the registration has not been done even at the, at the village chief level. So this is uh, one of the critical policies that um, uh, needs to be improved because if we don't have that notification, we can also know uh, what has happened and do uh, what uh, countries have been asked to to to, to carry out. It is really like the, the the maternal inquiry, so that inquiry that so into that, so really to understand what the, the woman or the women die from, and and this is only possible uh, if uh, you have a timely registration of those that and of course a follow up. To be able to avoid uh, some of the reasons why they die. Um, if I quickly go to my next slide, and um, um, I think the, um, the last point of this presentation is really looking at country cases. So if you're really interested in understand the policies and putting this in relationship with the outcomes and uh, that we, we're talking about right now, it's really, really looking at how countries are doing uh, regarding policies, but also other other indicators. And uh, within the work, uh, the countdown to 2030 work, we've put a uh, huge emphasis uh, to collect this data at the country level and really produce country-specific profiles. And I will tell you, it's very useful those profiles because sometimes, you know, when you engage countries um, around the progress and around how to improve in policy um, for accelerating change. Uh, they always say, okay, we have a lot of data, we know we have a lot of evidence, but is it possible for us to have it at a glance, for example, to know what should we do in terms of uh, making this change or this uh, acceleration of change possible? And this um, provide uh, some of those, those data, really putting things into interactions, really looking at you know the continuum of, of, of care. So looking at from family planning to postnatal care and really uh, putting there for countries how those different indicators between the continuum of care interact with each other and why the coverage of these interventions are really important. So we should not maybe focus on antenatal care or postnatal care, but really focus on the continuum of care. So those country cases give um, in-depth data. Uh, I've put there the internet side. I've provided in the presentation the uh, internet uh, link for you to, and in your own time or, or after the workshop, to really go through the countdown to 2030 website. I know I've, I've provided this information um, to the uh, workshop organizers uh, as a useful material uh, for you, but um, um, I will uh, emphasize the fact that. Um, uh, the, 
that the amount of information we've collected within the, the countdown work is really, really critical in terms to understand uh, where countries are regarding the reproductive maternal and child health issues, but really also understanding what uh, some of those elements within the WHO uh, building blocks, including, of course, the policy factors that can really explain those and where for each of those countries um, the changes and um, the adaptations or the change, uh, the, the improvement needs to be made for them to be able to accelerate the progress. Uh, or the decline in, in maternal mortality rate or progress in, in maternal and child health outcome. So if you see the countdown, of course, you can you can go to the home page and see what the countdown is all about in case you, you don't have the information and looking at global activities and, and really looking at uh, on regional, regional network activities. As I said, um, APHRC is leading the the East African and Central Southern Africa initiative, where we really work in close collaboration with, with different countries to really understand how we can help faster the progress, but also how we can provide critical opportunities for those countries to really interrogate the policies again, but really also interrogate um, the data that they have, the evidence, and see how uh, they can fast track the progress and also creating opportunities uh, to really sit within, as I say, the ministries of health or department within the ministry of health to looking at the annual review or midterm review or, or strategic plan review um, or putting even in place a monitoring and evaluation framework to see where they are. So the, uh, the two countries, um, I will say, if you want to kind of put um, a compare uh, what is going well and what is going not so well, I won't say bad, but what is not going so not so well in the Africa, Southern African uh, region, I will say uh, Cameroon and Rwanda, uh, that are very two outliers. So you have a group of countries that have done so well in the past five years. Uh, Rwanda is uh, one of them, where there have been critical policies and very um, um, performing community health systems uh, strategies to, to take to be able to really reduce as substantially the, the rate of uh, maternal mortality and even child mortality. And the Rwanda, um, as I say, a group of countries, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Kenya are also countries who have really pushed those um, rates down by also implementing free access to services, uh, which is, has been critical to improve the coverage, of course. Remember the critical intervention. So women who have ability to have antenatal care, skilled birth delivery, postnatal care, to reduce the complication within the continuum of care. And you have on the other side, as really an, an, an uh, outlier not doing very well, of course, you have Cameroon. So if you click on Cameroon, for example, in the countdown page, you have a detailed information on, on Cameroon. As I say, you have the demographics on the country. Uh, you have composite coverage index that are produced, and you can you know, also have information about how each of them are produced. Of course, you have the continuum of care, where they show you all the different type of dimension and how the country is faring. You see, for example, FP 36%, uh, postnatal care for women 59%, skilled birth attendance 67%, for example. And um, if you look policy-wise, if you scroll down, you have uh, also, uh, the cause of maternal death, of course, and cause of death on the on the five children, and then you have a whole section on policy system and financing. So, for each of those uh, um, countries, you can see, for example, is this policy in place? So, remember uh, what I said: the eleven policies that have to be to be in place. So, you can look for each of those countries. Do we have them in place or not? Yes or no? Uh, for example. So, uh, for example, civil society involvement in review of national maternal, newborn, and child health programs in Cameroon, yes. National coordinating body that looks at RMNCH and its component, yes. Uh, national human rights, you can see that. You can see information around uh, also financing and all that, and compare the numbers with, with, with other countries. So this is the Cameroon page, for example. And I say it's the same page across for different countries. So now if you go back to to to... To this, uh, for Rwanda, for example, 
So if you go to Rwanda uh, page, or if you click in Rwanda, you will also have the same information that pops out for you to see how Rwanda has been faring. And if you look at Rwanda, if you look at policies available and you look at coverage of care within the continuum of care, you will see slight uh, differences there. So they're very, in terms of um, access or coverage of interventions, they're very high compared to Cameroon, for example. So um, if you look, uh, for example, at uh, skilled birth attendance, you have 43% in, in Rwanda. Uh, you've seen they've made some critical improvement over the years, as I said. If you look at the policies, also the number of policies that they have in place that, that for example, Cameroon does not have in place, the system financing, as I said, it's way advanced in terms of reducing the, the inequity gaps uh, regarding the white point ties and all that. So this is an uh, internet site that you can really use as uh, extremely useful resources to really look at the country, looking at specific country progress of national progress, and really looking at those WHO building blocks elements that you can you know, put together to understand what is different in Cameroon, that we have to Cameroon compared to Rwanda, and compared to Kenya, and Malawi, and all that. So I really encourage you to, to do that on your own, and you can also maybe look at it, and then we can uh, have a further discussion, comment, or you know, question around that. So yeah, so country profiles. So if, if, if you, you can really take something out of, of, of this whole presentation and really understand uh, progress and policies in the region is really somewhat up in one word. I, this is um, one concept, this is universal health coverage. Uh, and I'm sure you're aware about the concept already. So really uh, um, meaning that all people and community can use a promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative and palliative health services they need of sufficient quality to be effective while also ensuring that the use of these services do not expose people to financial hardship. So the, the concept of universal health coverage, I will say, um, is now kind of, I will say the panacea. It has been there for, for a while, still the, um, the uh, beginning of 1980s and all that, but it's something that has been revisited right now. And this is mostly because, as I said at the beginning, most countries are having the declines that are expected and, and wanted, but there's still a large, large disparities within, within national and, and, and subnational level. So really, if you look at different countries when you work in the region, if you look at, again, being even Cameroon, Kenya, Rwanda, Malawi, uh, and all of those countries, if you look at where all policymakers are now focusing um, um, focusing their attention within the Ministry of Health, is really how do we achieve USC? If you look at countries like Kenya or Rwanda, you see what they call the big four, big five, where USC is really at the heart of everything, including even uh, the heart of development goals and all that. How do we make sure that everybody has access to equitable, equitable health? And of course, it translates, this USC translates to maternal. Um, maternal and child health also and and i will say um uh, if you build from the presentation what i said earlier is that if you don't have equitable access so if you don't have equity and you don't have a coverage equitable coverage of of, of really critical maternal uh, health interventions you really cannot achieve substantial decline in maternal mortality uh, uh, maternal uh, health outcomes because women will still not have as I said, the critical services that they need within the continuum of care. So this is now um, what the main target policy-wise is. Uh, I would say it's not been has not been easy for countries to implement those because it takes a lot of um, of critical elements in place. And if you see the the, the the picture on the on the slide right now, you will see uh, how USC is achieved, and it's not uh, really an easy an easy, easy target for countries. So really increasing the, non, uh, the coverage for the non-covered. Uh, for example, if um, uh, postnatal care is still at 49% across, how can we pull it all the way to 80 or 100%? Uh, reducing the cost sharing and fees. Uh, how can we ensure equity and making sure um, that um, all women have access to service without exposing themselves to financial hardship? 
which is really critical, but at the same time ask for a lot of resources. So if you see a lot of countries like Kenya, for example, with the USC targets and how they're going about policies, really looking how do we pull enough money to make free access to services, maternal health services, without having to increase taxes, without depending too much on international funding. So it's really a, a very, a very um, a difficult uh, uh, interrogation, a, dif a difficult policy making process to make that possible. And of course, the last, the last gap there, uh, the last step uh, to achieving USCF, of course, including uh, uh, other services. And what I've seen here uh, um, from my work in the region is that when we're talking about maternal health and coverage interventions, for some reason, we don't talk about maternal mental health. Uh, uh, topics that have been ignored for, for a while now, maybe because you know, um, we didn't have enough evidence showing that this is an issue. And of course, if you look at studies or evidence on the, um, the issue, you see maternal mental health is related to maternal and of course child health and even, even death. Uh, and already the pressure of, of uh, among women um, uh, in uh, developing countries and even in sub-Saharan Africa are quite uh, high or relatively high. So how do we also make sure when we're talking about UHC and uh, tackling all the different um, uh, uh, um, elements of access to care or quality care, we also talk about those that are left out like uh, maternal and mental health. It's something also that a lot of countries are doing. So UHC, uh, literally to be able to 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 ensure that we have equity, adequate coverage, of course, uh, further reduction so that those countries can achieve uh, what they set to achieve. Uh, uh, and of course, we can have the whole global target also being, being achieved. So um, I will stop here. Uh, this is, um, uh, as I say, mostly to give you an overall or at least a bird eye view of what the issues are. And um, I'm sure we have opportunities to, to discuss further. And then you can also ask questions and we can uh, go more in depth in the, the issue. So thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, feel free to, yeah, to reach for questions and, and comments. Hi, welcome back everyone. Uh, it's great to have Estelle now for uh, the Q&A session with us. Uh, we have time until uh, half past, uh, so it's not that much time, but do feel free to post your questions on the portal uh, board. We actually already have one question. I probably will start with that one. Um, so the question from um, Shalaya um, about the sexual, um, social determinants of health model and um, she said it's great to see it's being used um, in um, reproductive, maternal, newborn and child health. And the question is actually uh, whether, as all you know, there is any training provided for the primary healthcare level um, to work with this model, I understand. Um, thank, yeah, thank you, uh, Yulia. Uh, thank you for the question also. Uh, yes, it's, uh, the model is incredibly important, especially to uh, for either be the decision makers and also the health workers to actually understand what are the determinants of health, of course, of poor health. Uh, but in terms of if I've listened, I will understand the question well, it's really around training. Um, I don't think there is a specific training about that, uh, especially at uh, the primary healthcare level. Um, and uh, why do I say that? Uh, because um, as I mentioned in my presentation, we are currently working intensively with countries. Uh, this is, as I say, within the countdown to 2030 initiative and uh, with uh, the GFF funding. So I really uh, trying to see what are the, the gaps at country level in terms of uh, understanding where the problems are, understanding what the determinants of, of, of maternal uh, uh, mortality is and um, are, and also what is determinant even in terms of access to healthcare or demand of healthcare uh, are in the countries. And uh, what you can see actually, um, uh, even at a national level, is that there's still a lot of gaps in terms of capacity strengthening. So really, we had at some point decided to really do a continuous workshop uh, with countries, so working closely with a number of countries. Uh, um, uh, taking them through the presentation on those models and also uh, taking them actually through 
uh, how they can use their own data system and data that are available or evidence that are available to actually uh, uh, question or respond to some of those, uh, understand some of those indicators or those determinants. So, um, so there's a question I would say there's a huge gap even at national levels. So what primary healthcare, I think, is still something that needs to be to be done. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, I was actually wanted to follow up on this and maybe take you from national to, to the subnational level because you mentioned that this is really an um, upcoming, like there is a lot of recognition for the problem on the subnational level, how to uh, do the continuity of care provision, but also financing. And I wonder um, if you can tell a bit more whether there is, whether your institute or what is being done to track um, the access to the maternity health care on the subnational level, uh, whether we have any data on that or how it's being monitored and uh, if you can tell a bit more about that. Yeah, th thank you. I think that's, that's a very important question. Um, uh, so what we started doing within now our, our countdown initiative is really to recognize first that we need to look at subnational levels and also have um, the country understanding that we have to stop looking at the, the outcomes just in the capital city or the, the you know the main cities of the countries, and what are uh, really dragging the progress uh, uh, behind is really those uh, small other cities or those rural places where the outcomes are not that great. So really looking uh, if if you want to really look at either being uh, provision of services or financing of services, especially domestic uh, financing of services. You really have to look at what you're doing at national level, and you also have to look at what you're doing within the cities, but also within the rural places. And looking at all the regions, um, I, I'm sure if you know a bit of the background of some of those countries in in, in the sub-Saharan Africa, we tend to really focus the energy on on the, the big the big cities where you have the best hospitals, or at least relatively <laughs> better hospital than in rural places. And even within those. Um, those big cities, if you look at countries like uh, Kenya, for example, you see, uh, if you look at the main, the main uh, part of the city, the wealthiest part of the city, you have better services that, than for populations who live in, in slum settlements, for example. So uh, really, uh, uh, the, 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 the focus now is how do we uh, looking at what are we doing at the national level, what are we doing in these cities and within cities in the poor settings of the cities, and what are we doing in the rural places? And that's where the shift is. And I think this is where we will make the, you know, the best, the best input or the best progress uh, in the region in the next uh, few years. Yeah. And do you know how, uh, basically, what, how easy or how, like, what is, what are the challenges of collecting the data on the subnational level, and what the countdown uh, to um, 2030 actually is doing something for, in, in that respect? Yeah, so collecting data is not really that uh, great at that level, uh, especially in rural uh, settings. If you look at, uh, as I say, the, in Western and Central Africa, if you look at countries like Congo, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and all that, countries that really have huge problems in terms of uh, data collection in those remote areas that are not really connected to the central system. Uh, what we've observed is that most countries do not have adequate data from some national levels. There are some countries who are trying, like Rwanda and Kenya, of course, but it, it really goes back to having equal funding for all of those uh, uh, counties or all of those sub, you know, all of those other areas than the main, than the main, uh, than the main capital city. And uh, uh, what we're trying to do to address that within the countdown is really uh, within our workshop in the past two years for each country to actually understand what type of data they have. Uh, what kind of uh, evidence they have at national and subnational level. Uh, also, the ability to really strengthen the ability to actually looking at how funding is distributed within the main, uh, you know, uh, capital and other areas, other provinces of, of, of the country. So I will say in terms of data, not that accurate, but within the world, we are trying to actually assess what exists and uh, also access how we can provide those countries some uh, uh, some uh, some some models to be able to improve or, or the quality of data that they have at least improve the system that they are using especially if you know now the DHIS uh, system that was put in place by by the World Bank and WHO I think it's it's I would say it's helping countries the data that's trickling in are still not great 
So you see, for example, some, some national levels, you see coverage of uh, measles or coverage of vaccine at 120% from some rural places, uh, meaning uh, the, the, the way they're inputting the data is not that great. So I think, yeah, so the, I think for those kind of system at national level and that have those ability, uh, pos uh, possibility for countries to enter data also at some national level, um, um, it will make a difference. So they just have to kind of um, um, uh, strengthen the, I will say the, the, the ability, but also the commitment and willingness to be able to work with those kind of tools like the DHIS tool. Great. So it's, yeah, it's really the move towards collecting what is there and trying to gather, like to do the patchwork. Uh, we have actually a question related to funding um, and it's from Simon um, about basically giving the limits and the funding, what are the two critical factors for um, equity of provision? Because you mentioned equity is very important and prioritized. Um, uh, notably, um, so he mentions locally rec uh, recruited, uh, but uh, fully trained midwives, for example, like we discussed it in a Danish case. So if you can tell a bit more of the strategies for the equity and how it's um, kind of um, contrasted with the financing or supported um, with the financing or the limits thereof. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think if you just look at generally at funding, um, um, I would say from my own perspective, our experience is always unfortunate to see that the domestic funding has not increased over the years or country is not pushing as much as they should. Uh, they can blame it on, uh, you know, inability to collect taxes and all of those uh, other issues. But I think there's a lot that needs to be done there. If I look at just maybe the, you know, the global, the GFF, the global financing uh, uh, facility, where countries are really encouraged to put some money in and have a percentage of that top up by the, the GFF, uh, you see a lot of countries are still lagging behind in terms of what the, the code part that they have to put to put in the system. So if you look at uh, uh, what I would say we're trying to advocate right now, it's really uh, looking at the most vulnerable in terms of equity. So most countries will use these uh, short tools uh, to assess the social demographic uh, characteristics and uh, of population and actually understand who are the poorest of the, the poor. And uh, those ones are uh, those who will have access to subsidized services or free, free care services. Um, some countries like Kenya, Rwanda have tried uh, universal free coverage of maternal and child health services. We know they have a lot of challenges uh, in, in terms of implementation, but they are also helping. So in terms of, of equity, I will say it's really now in terms of how do we how do we target the poor, the poor, the poorest actually of the poor? And, and uh, maybe in the next few years is really being, how do we actually reach that uh, universal health coverage? Right, thank you. Um, there is a comment just aside that uh, Laura Richardson said that it's very good that you, very important that you're considering mental health in, within maternal and reproductive health. And I know that this has been quite uh, an area uh, of your expertise. I wonder if you have wanted to say something about this very quickly in terms of where you looked at and what do you think should be priorities in, in the mental health of maternal health area? Yeah, it's something that we started and uh, uh, doing as a research at APHRC recently. Um, uh, it's also because we're looking at uh, policies and really see what needs to be uh, tackled still on the, on the continent. And mental health is a big issue. And um, um, I've, I've uh, uh, implemented a project recently with uh, the Grand Challenges uh, of Funds to really look at uh, the issue among adolescent girls, especially. So uh, mental health outcomes within uh, pregnancy and also the postpartum period. And I can tell you that a lot of those girls really have those suicide ideations. They don't want to access services because they, they feel like stigmatized. Uh, they feel like there's nobody who understands the situation. They feel, they really feel like there's, there's nothing that is available for them in terms of mental support. And uh, moving from that project, we really started looking at community level, what are some of those innovations or, or, or interventions that were available for women for maternal mental health. And we've seen most of the countries do not have such interventions. And uh, this is quite critical. So um, what I understand from talking to health uh, uh, systems implementers is that we're still focusing really at surviving and, and thriving might not be where we are now because of limited resources but but at the same time like we, we really have to leapfrog we really have to to really look at mental health uh, and physical health because you know we can't talk about health without talking about mental health 
yeah, so it's something that really needs to be considered now. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to take you um, a bit actually to the point of financing because I think that's also, well, there's a question about that and you have expertise in this as well. Uh, so a lot of, uh, it's a question from Anonymous, a lot of aid money is being spent on training for good uh, intrapartum cases in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, is this money well spent or should it be spent elsewhere? So can you comment on this perhaps? I, I wouldn't say generally, um, it, it's a country by country um, situation. So you can't say generally it's, it's a good or bad way of spending money. I think what we're trying to do, and this, especially within the, the GFF uh, initiative, is really for countries to understand where the money should be best spent. So really what, what are the priorities? And also, of, co of course, reducing, you know, waste, wasting money or, or reducing inefficiency within the system and all that. So um, one thing that we, we hope is that country can actually sit together, do, uh, as I say, within the ministries or between uh, major departments of the ministries to be able to understand what are the key priorities and uh, where they should actually put the resources to have the most impact. And I think it's something that uh, um, it's not, they're not at that level yet, but as I say, uh, with capacity strengthening in the region, I think, yeah, uh, we, we will move, uh, you know, surely and maybe gradually towards that uh, uh, toward that point. So, yeah, so I would not say not well spent, but as, again, country by country case. Yeah, and in that respect, basically, the question was about the aid money. And now I wonder, um, to what extent, what, what, what do you think about the involvement of the private sector and the PPP model, so private-public partnerships, which are being so much publicized for the achievement of the universal health coverage? So I wonder, what is your view um, for achievement universal, achieving universal health coverage in maternity health uh, through the PPP models, like are they? Um, do you think that they are the future? Do you are you critical of them? What do you think in general of that? Move? Yeah, I, I think it's critical. I think it's critical. If you look at most of the countries that have been working in, uh, most of the the the, the 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 women have access to private facilities, and if you see across the region, there have been a lot of push to really upgrade and improve those. Uh, private facilities and to reduce the, the fees uh, for women to have access to some quality of care. Uh, this is because, of course, the public health system have not uh, much improved in terms of quality and access, uh, in terms of access at different, uh, in different regions of the country. Um, the, the private uh, uh, um, a contribution is, is, is important and I would say is critical, especially for the maternal and child health. Uh, what I would say maybe that maybe we need to pay a bit more attention to is that they don't work in, si in, in silo because you have sometimes uh, the private sector moving with some funding, international funding, uh, implementing some, some initiative or interventions without working in collaboration with the government. So there's still this need to really have a good collaboration between the government itself and the private sector. And uh, yeah, but yeah, I will say in countries where you have um, uh, if I take, for example, the countries where we have the GFF funding to look at this kind of collaboration, strong collaboration, it's something that it's happening because when you're having uh, those uh, annual meetings with uh, uh, the countries we, we, we have on board the private sector, we have the government, uh, we have the, the institutional, the, the, the university as uh, research academic institution, so they're really able to sit together and, 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 and speak together. So I think, yeah, I think it's just maybe continuing to strengthening the the, the, the synergies that they're using so that we don't have duplication of interventions that you know are not really uh, bringing the impact that we're looking for. Absolutely. Um, there is a question in the comment there. I started with the comment from Simon, perhaps if you want to comment. So Simon says, uh, I'm worried um, targeted quote unquote care for uh, poorest, un uh, poorest undermines equity of uni universalism like the 1980s selective primary health care um, subverted Alma Ata declarations, uh, declaration principles. Um, so basically, make, do you think that targeting the poorest population specifically actually um, can be, um, well, not really uh, benefiting uh, equity? I, I understand that. And kind of basically selective primary healthcare can be um, doing worse than, than, than good. Maybe yeah, I think that's a great, 
Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I actually had this, the same comment during, I think it was on next, last week, Monday, when we had um, a meeting uh, with the World Bank and WHO on how do we take next accountability for, for financing maternal and child health in Africa. And one of the questions that, um, uh, one of the points that I made is that um, we tend to have quick fixes. And I understand because sometimes it's, it's linked to reduce funding or at least not enough funding. But uh, of course, targeting a particular segment of the population is ensuring that at least we can reduce a bit of the burden of the debt on, some, on, on countries and on those poorest women. But at the same time, we do not really achieve universal health coverage, especially when you talk about quality of care. So uh, one of the suggestions that uh, was uh, mentioning and, 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 and hoping that they will consider is really uh, at financing level, how do we really understand how affordable care is for the population in, a, in, a, in the Sub-Saharan African region? Because uh, there are some few uh, papers now, uh, here and there about the cost of, uh, of maternal child health services, but not really uh, most around affordability of care. I, I, I always say I will agree against people saying, oh, you know what, the people who are rich in countries have access to good quality care. That's, that's not true. They can pay for some services if they need it, but they don't have access to good quality care. And this is because you have, you know, uh, uh, quality care is quite expensive in some of those countries. And uh, if you want to afford that, you, of course, have to let go some of those uh, investment in household, like education for children and all that, and really continue into this cycle of poverty. So I think for me, if I have to advocate, is really not focusing on those quick fees or just focusing on the poorest, but really looking at how can we make care more affordable for all women across across the population. Yeah, that's right, women, men, and yeah, that's true. We have we are running out of time, um, and I have two questions. I can tell you them together, and then you just kind of maybe can address them together. So one question was about the difficulties of collecting data on maternal mental health, and maybe you can briefly say how you um, how you tackled that challenge. And the other question uh, is again from uh, Shalila. Um, as the SDGs are supported to be bottom up, is there any likelihood that participatory methods of delivery might be adopted? So if you can tell briefly about those, it would be great. Okay. There. So, so briefly in terms of mental health, my um, experience is that uh, we need to have um, kind of context specific or, um, uh, tools that we adapt within the context. Uh, the EPDS uh, 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 tool uh, has worked for us, but really uh, looking at contextualizing it and translating it and, and really make sure that women understand those questions because they're not formulated with the experience of, uh, of the African woman in mind. So it's really contextualizing some of those tools and uh, yeah, it can make uh, some difference there. And in terms of the bottom-up approach, um, we, 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 we kind of targeting the, 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 the inverse, like really have also women or at least community have the input and the views around what is being done. Um, I, I will say um, we are not there yet in the regions, but uh, uh, what you can get, for example, is just those uh, academic institutions doing those participatory methods where they really talk to women and community to understand what they need and, and, and uh, what they actually have as services. But I think it's something that needs to be improved. Great, thank you, Estelle. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Mm -hmm.